first of all, if you ah, these sheets are if you want to be on the Free Software Foundation's announcement mailing list, you can write down your name and your email address, and we'll put you on the list. So we're going to pass these papers around, and at the end we're going to collect them. And so when everybody's, you know, when it's a whole section has those who want to have written their coordinates, then just leave them visible. We'll collect them at the end, or you can bring them here at the end, and uh, we'll get you onto the list. Now, please, I have some uh, conditions about photos of me. If you uh, please do not put photos showing me on Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp. <laughs> What's funny? <laughs> well, you shouldn't have done that. Please delete them. And in any case, don't do it anymore. It's very bad treatment of a person to put a photo of that person in that company. That company is a monstrous surveillance engine. It uses people to get personal data about them and about others. Facebook, and so Facebook does not have users, it has users. <laughs> And it can recognize people in photos by their faces or the backs of their heads. So once, if you put a photo of someone into any branch of that company, you are helping that monster track that person. In other words, you are doing harm to that person. If you posted a photo of me onto one of those, you did me wrong. So please don't do that to me ever again, and please don't do it to your friends either. It's a very bad way to treat your friends. Not only that, you were using non-free software to do it. <laughs> and that takes away your freedom. So it did wrong to you also. The second point is, if you want to take a photo of me with a mobile device, first, make sure that the functionality of putting the geolocation into photos is deactivated. Because if the photo has a geolocation, then no matter how you distribute it, you're tracking that person. It's wrong. So, if you are thinking of taking a photo of me or with me using a mobile device, turn off geolocation in photos first. And you can't achieve that just by turning off location. You have to go to the camera app parameters, and there you will see a special parameter about location in photos. Deactivate that, then it's not dangerous in that way. Finally, if you want to make an audio or video recording and distribute copies, please do so only in the formats that are favorable to free software. Those are the AUG formats and the WebM format. Also, make sure that the website that distributes it permits people to download it without running any non-free software themselves. For instance, YouTube has non-free JavaScript code in the web pages, and unless you run that, you can't even see the recording. So don't put these videos on YouTube or any other site which does wrong to people in the same way, or a similar way. And finally, please put on the recordings a statement that it is released under the Creative Commons No Derivatives License. Because this is a presentation of a point of view. <clears throat> oh, and we might as well get out some of the stickers that are in there because it looks like uh, people took them all, so they obviously want some more. <laughs>
Um, so, what is free software? Free software is software that respects users' freedom and community. So, if you want to have freedom in your use of computers and phones, the way you get it is by making sure the software respects your freedom and doesn't take it away. When we say free here, we're we mean livery. We're not talking about price. The word free in English is ambiguous. That's unfortunate. So I've got to clear it up. Uh, in Portuguese, if you say livre, then people know you don't mean price. And I don't mean price either. Whether you pay to get a copy of a program or receive it as a gift, that's a minor little detail. I'm not concerned with that detail. I'm concerned with a more important question. Once you have the program, does it respect your freedom or does it take away your freedom? <coughs> That's an important ethical question. So what's a program? What's a computer? A computer is a universal computing device. Which means, conceptually, it's very simple. It can only do one thing. Get the next instruction and do whatever that says. And then get the next instruction and do whatever that says. And get the next instruction and do whatever that says. Millions of times a second, it gets the next instruction and does what that says. The instructions come from a program. So depending on what instructions are in that particular program, the computer will do one thing or another or another. And with the right program, that same computer could do anything at all, except for some things that are impossible. <laughs> but, you know, there are some things that no computer can do. But within the range of things that are possible, with the right program, this computer will do any of them. And so will your computer. So the question is, who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you, when really it's someone else. <laughs> you might think your computer is obeying you, when really it's obeying its true master. <laughs> and it does things for you when its true master permits. To the extent its true master permits. With any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other, because there's no other way it could be. When the users control the program, that program is free software because it respects the user's freedom and community. <coughs> what does freedom mean? Freedom is having control over your own life, control over the activities that you do in your life. If you use a program to do the activity, control over the activity requires control of the program. So, when the users control the program, that program respects the user's freedom and community. I'll explain in a few minutes how community relates to this. Uh, and so it's free software. <clears throat> in practice, concretely, a program is free software if it carries the four essential freedoms. These, if it gives each user these four essential freedoms, then the users control the program, so it's free software. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program however you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the program's source code and change it so it does your computing activities the way you wish. Why do we emphasize the need for source code? 
Over there you see some source code. It's a mixture of English and math. If you have learned the programming language, you can read the program, figure out what it does, then you can make changes so it does some different thing that you prefer. In order to run the program, we generally convert it into an executable, which is a series of enigmatic ones and zeros. Well, for a short program like this, it's not a very hard job to figure out what those ones and zeros mean. There are a bunch of instructions. But for a typical program, if the program is 100,000 lines of source code, it will be millions of ones and zeros. And figuring out what those ones and zeros mean is a very hard job. It's one method of reverse engineering. And it's so hard that people only do it as a last resort when they're desperate. So if the developer tells users, you're free to change this program, if only you can figure out what these ones and zeros mean, but that's not really respecting users' freedom. That's making a mockery of users' freedom. So in order for freedom one to be a real freedom, the users must have the source code. These two freedoms, zero and one, give us separate control of the program, meaning each user separately has the right to change the program and use it. So I'm free to change my copies and use them, and you're free to change your copies and use them, and you're free to change your copies and use them. Only separately. Well, separate control is absolutely necessary, but it's not enough because most users don't know how to program. They do other things, they have different talents. Not everybody is going to be, is able to be a good programmer. But they still deserve control over their community. How can non-programmers participate in exercising control over the software they use? Through collective control, and this is where community comes in. Collective control means that each user is free to collaborate with others to exercise, to change the program collectively and thus collectively decide what it will do and what it won't do. At the top we see a group of three users who are working together to change the program. The two that are on the right are directly touching the code. They must be programmers. The one on the left is not touching the code. That user might not be a programmer, but is exercising control over the program by participating in the discussions about what changes they're going to make. <clears throat> Those who collaborate in this way are whoever chooses to collaborate. At the bottom there are two more users who are not working with that group. They're using the program in its original version. Why are they not working with the other three? Well, uh, it could be any reason. Uh, maybe they don't know each other. Maybe they know each other but they don't like each other. Or maybe the two users at the bottom trust the three at the top, but they disagree about what is desirable. They might prefer the original version to the version that those three are making. It's up to them. Maybe tomorrow they will decide to work together, all five. Each one of them is free to cooperate with those who want to cooperate with her. I should explain I'm using a uh, third person singular gender neutral pronouns, person, per, and hers, that I found in a book by Marge Piercy. They work just like she, her, and hers. It's terribly confusing to use plural pronouns for a singular antecedent, and I absolutely refuse to do so. <laughs> now I understand it's the air blowing on this 
requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is to uh, make exact copies of the program as you got it and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. Note that being a free program includes giving everyone the right to make copies and sell them. We are not for gratis software. We are for freedom respecting software. <clears throat> so, these two freedoms give the users the right to cooperate on changing the program. Because if one person in the group, and the group can be informal, it's whoever chooses to cooperate that day, the point is if any one of these users makes a change, that user with freedom three is free to make copies of that and distribute them to others in the group. And they, with freedom two, can make more copies of that and redistribute them to others in the group. They can also offer copies to those who are not in the group. They can even publish that version, which means making it available to the general public. So, if the program gives every user these four freedoms in a full and adequate way, then it's free software because the users control the program both separately and collectively, and therefore it respects their freedom and their community. But if one of those freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the users don't fully control the program. Instead, the program controls the users, and the proprietor controls the program. So this, pro this program, because it is non-free, generates a system of unjust power. Power for the developer or proprietor over whoever <coughs> uses that program. This is an injustice. This power is, unjust, is unjust. No one should ever have such power. Therefore, all proprietary software is an injustice. And so, to avoid doing wrong and harming the world, you should never develop or promote a non-free program. It's better to do nothing at all than to be a, a proprietary software developer. It's like being a corrupt politician. It's better to do nothing at all than to be a corrupt politician. Proprietary software makes the world a less free and worse place. So if you can't find a way to have a job developing free software, ethically speaking, the next best thing is don't develop software. Get some other kind of job. However, this injustice, the basic injustice of non-free software leads to other injustices, malicious functionalities. You see, the proprietary software developers nowadays are conscious of the power they have over their users. And this power corrupts them. They constantly face the temptation to try to get more money by mistreating their own users explicitly, by putting malicious functionalities into the programs, which will then mistreat the users in a way that benefits the developer. What they're doing is making malware. Malware means a program designed to run in a way that mistreats the users. So malware is a question entirely of what is in the code. Does the code treat users well or bad? For free versus proprietary software, that's a different matter. That's entirely about how the program is made available for users to use. It has, it's independent 
of what the code says. Any program, regardless of what's in its code, could be released as free software and could be released as proprietary software. Sometimes it's released in both ways in parallel. So whether it's free or proprietary has nothing to do, it's independent of what the code says. So philosophically, proprietary software and malware are orthogonal issues. <coughs> They're independent. But in practice, they go together. Because proprietary software nowadays is usually malware. And free software is almost never malware. And the reasons for this are perfectly clear. In the case of proprietary software, the developer faces the temptation to make it malware. And nobody can stop her. Person can, if person decides to make it malware, the users are helpless. They can't fix it. They can't remove or change the malicious parts. Whereas with free software, the users always have ultimate control. And if they don't like some contribution we made, the users can fix it. They can get rid of the code that mistreats them or that they simply don't like. So this is why malware is found in proprietary software. What does it look like? Well, often the proprietary programs spy on users. This example is from the Amazon Swindle, Amazon's ebook reader. Swindle is not its official name. <laughs> but it describes the product well because it was designed to swindle readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, uh, Amazon knows what people are reading because the swindle from time to time sends Amazon the title of the book and the page number. So even if the user got the book from someplace else, not from Amazon, Amazon still knows that person is reading that book. If the user enters any notes, they are all sent to Amazon servers. If the user highlights any text, sent to Amazon. Total Orwellian surveillance of reading. But there are many other programs and products that spy on users. Flash Player helps websites track users. Uh, Windows spies on users. Mac OS spies on users. <coughs> iOS, the system of the eye monsters, spies on users. <laughs> and uh, Android spies on users. Remember that some components of Android are free software and some are proprietary. One proprietary component is Google Play and it spies on users. But many apps spy on users. Even flashlight apps. Somebody noticed that the flashlight app was sending messages to various websites. Why in the world? All it's supposed to do is turn it on the screen. Why does that require communication with anyone? Only for spying. All the streaming apps spy on the user. Things like Spotify and Netflix which I have never used and never will use. Because they make the user identify herself and then they uh, keep track of all the things that that user listens to or watches. Because the app is tied to a particular server and that server finds out everything the user do does through the app. This is an injustice above and beyond the injustice of being proprietary software. So I say, out, out, damn Spotify. And Netflix is just as bad. 
let's flick off Netflix. <laughs> and Uber is just as bad. It makes users identify themselves. So the Uber server, as a result, finds out where each person goes. The app also spies on the user's movements before and after the ride. So the Uber's client app is malware. Someone did a study of thousands of Android apps, the most popular ones, and found that of the paid apps, 60% of them had recognizable tracking code to track the user. And of the gratis apps, 90% had recognizable trackers. So when I say that proprietary software is usually malware, I have fig hard figures to go on. There are also products that are tethered to a particular <laughs> server, like the Fitbit. The Fitbit sends personal data to the company, which then offers to sell it to the user, to sell the user per own personal data. No way. <clears throat> and in the Internet of Stings, as I call it, uh, because almost every Internet of Stings product is somehow malware. Uh, it's normal that these products insist that the user set up an account on a particular server and then require the user to work to control it through that account. That's spying on people. And not only that, if the manufacturer ever thinks that it's not worth running that server anymore, it will shut the server off and the product becomes non-functional. But there are other kinds of malicious functionalities. For instance, DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, uh, Digital Handcuffs. What is the word for handcuffs in Portuguese? Algema. Algema digital. So uh, this is when the product or program is designed specifically to stop users from doing what they want to do. It's very common practice. This example shows the blue ray that uh, attacks users when they want to copy. <laughs> I regard blue ray disks as enemies. I know that they were designed to attack my freedom and your freedom. And because of that, I absolutely <coughs> refuse to use them. I have never used one. Because my principle is never use a device that was designed to uh, restrict you unless you personally have available whatever it takes to break the handcuffs, handcuffs so that it can't restrict you anymore. So if you have free software to read a Blu-ray disc, by all means read Blu-ray discs. I don't have any, so I never read a Blu-ray disc. But DRM is found in many other things as well. Windows and Mac OS and Android and the software of the iMonsters, they all implement the basis for DRM so that applications can then do DRM easily. <clears throat> Flash Player has DRM. The Amazon Swindle has DRM. And the streaming apps 